Hey, what's going on, you guys? So today I wanted to talk to you about this article I got forwarded by the Historical Gamer. It concerns Hearts Iron 4, Man the Guns. So, uh, yeah. And I'm doing this outside because it's a beautiful day out. Uh, got my coffee on. And, yeah, let's talk about this article a little bit. It was on Wargamer.com by Joe Robinson, who I actually know. I've actually communicated with him in the past. Uh, good guy. So... Let's dive into it, right? So they talk about, they release a couple of tidbits from Heart to Iron for Man the Guns, but also talks about the transition of Heart to Iron. It's just cars in the background, so my bad about that. Talks about the background, the transition of Heart to Iron 3 to Heart to Iron 4 being more simplified. So a couple things I pieced out, and I'll put the screenshots on so you guys can see and follow along. He wrote, I first started Paradox playing Paradox titles in 2009, release of Heart to Iron 3. While I'm not a true grognard in terms of personal gaming history, I love the bonkers complexity of Heart to Iron 3. Me too. And well understand how fans of past games could feel there was something missing from Heart to Iron 4. I mentioned last year there's a war raging for the soul of Heart to Iron. As we look back and reflect on the two previous released expansions, as well as the plans for the upcoming Man the Guns update, it can now be said that this is a war that the World War II purists are losing. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think the way Heart to Iron 4 is going, we are kind of losing that war, unfortunately. Or actually, maybe not, because the last expansion they um, added army groups, I believe. They added a couple of features to. You could add army groups now on top of theaters and, and, and regular armies and stuff. So that they are tweaking a little bit to kind of satisfy a little bit of that audience so while computer game computer war games in general have shown a reluctance to evolve over the past couple of decades it's oddly gratifying to see that heart to iron 4's broad strokes approach to war gaming has managed to find an audience especially since it hasn't made our initial list of top world war ii war games even i missed the granality that came with heart to iron 3's chain of command don't we all even i missed the but I suspect that it, it was something that was never meant to be really part of the series DNA to begin with. I disagree with, you know, Heart to Iron, you know, I've played Heart to Iron since the uh, original, the 90s. I remember picking up Heart to Iron uh, around 34th Street. I was still living, uh, I was in Brooklyn at the time and taking a train down to 34th Street, going to the original uh, store that actually sold PC games, which was an awesome experience and picking up Heart to Iron 1 was incredible. Uh, still remember that to this day. And there was always complexity in Heart to Iron. It was always um, a chain of command system. I, I remember you could make divisions. I don't know if you could make cores in Heart to Iron 1, but I think it was more complexity in it than with Heart to Iron 4. There were plenty of great realistic hardcore war games for World War II enthusiasts, and Heart to Iron is now in a position where it no longer needs to specifically cater to that crowd. This is true to the point where alternate history sandbox options are being designed with as much care and attention as real world history options. The problem that I have with this is, yeah, there are games like War in the Pacific, uh, Age Odd games out there. The problem is, is all these games are missing key components that's hard, that Heart to Iron has. Like, for example, a great diplomacy system, a tech tree, like certain things that Heart to Iron had that these games don't. You know, Heart to Iron had the full package and it had a complex chain of command system, uh, war, uh, naval warfare system. Uh, I just feel like those have been um, dumbed down, which. I'm not on board. So a couple of things that the game director mentioned uh, that he that was in this interview, he wrote, I really think we need some settings and tools to allow people to tailor what happens to the world. So you can set up a scenario beforehand. Heart to Iron 4 will always be a World War II game, I think, even if we expand it, Cold War, or something, at the core it will be World War II. I wonder what he meant by, even if we expand it, I hope that includes Cold War, or Korean War, or something like that, right? Wrote another thing, I really think we need some settings and tools to allow people to tailor what happens to the world. So you can set up a scenario beforehand. Heart to Iron 4 will always be a World War II game, I think. I don't know, I wrote that. 
bloody heck. I don't know why I posted that twice. We also have a schedule for which nations we think should get a facelift. America is like the second or third most popular nation. And honestly, I think their experience is pretty lacking right now. And they are a big naval, uh, naval nation. So it really fits to tie those two things together. It's sticking out like a sore thumb to me. There's a lot of systems that also tie into that you might think not about. You might not think about. Wow. I need to live in the country or something, man. <laughs> Norfolk is a lot less uh, noisier than Brooklyn, but daggone. The U.S. and the U.K. get new focus tr trees to bring them in line with the emerging strength of the old history narrative. So that's game director Dan Lind. Dan, please, as a old-time war gamer, please add in what I really want, Dan, what we all want. We want divisions, corps, armies, army groups, theaters, and all of them to have commanders that we can promote get experience and skills that's what we want please add that into the game also the naval section needs to be a lot more I would say in depth I love the hard to iron three approach you guys did I felt it was a lot more complex and a lot more detailed we lost a lot of that please bring that back Let's see, let's dive into the features here. I wanna make this video under 10 minutes. So I'm gonna jump right through this. One big awesome thing that they're adding in, which I really love is a non-specific feature is the return of fuel. A staple of past hard to iron games, the life of armor warfare makes a return. I love that because in hard to iron three, you had to manage your supply. You know, you can't, if you were doing Barbarossa, you couldn't attack on Northern, Central, and Southern fronts. You had to kind of like, all right, where can I put all my fuel and resources into because obviously you didn't have enough to do a massive assault like that uh, especially if you're US you always had to worry about transport and stuff like that and I love that because it added a realistic element that's gonna be a free uh, addition to the game coming later this December uh, stockpiles will be limited buildings will need to hold fuel which which will compete with existing industry slots and you will need to make tactical choices as to when and where you used things that need fuel thanks this will encompass air, land, and sea, so you will have a lot of demands on your fuel consumption. I love that. It's realistic. This also affects unit balancing. The team can feel more confident in making tanks extra powerful if you know that a player may not be able to give them enough fuel to move, for example. A couple things. Like, oh, I want to keep this on a uh, couple more minutes. Uh, ship design. You can design specific loadouts and clash of your ship to make each one semi-unique. This will involve more research avenue as you unlock new parts chassis and weapons as well as concepts like peacetime training refitting your ships will now also be an important aspect of maintaining your navy much more simply than building a shoot new ship i love that i think they bring that over from east versus west where you can upgrade your ship because just adding new ships all the time is just pain in the ass ships now uh, ships getting refilled will disappear from the map going back to the production queue which is awesome Ship terrain is a move reminiscent of Solaris, as done post 2.0. Different sea zones will have diff uh, terrain features to represent how different sea areas behave differently. These, the seas around the Swedish archipelago, for example, could allow for entire fleets to hide amongst the landmass, while something like the Atlantic might be prone to bad weather, which will affect the performance of smaller ships, also sharks. Okay. New spotting system, it says, at the moment, the fleet mechanics basically mean that everyone finds everyone else eventually. There's no consideration given to units that may not want to be found, like submarines. Fleets in general will also disengage a lot easier, which is also, which is trying to tackle the problem of decisive naval engagement being too easier to trigger. Really big on, big fleet on fleet engagements revolved around strategic, strategic concerns, important islands and areas that need attacking or defending at all costs. Task forces. The team wants to make fleets smaller to avoid death balls, which is reminiscent of the same problem Solaris has. 
set of fleets that will be now be task forces, which will have composition and size restrictions, but will also have better behavior options, being able to set areas of operations, what they do within that AO, granular rules, engagement, etc. Uh, last but not least, I'm over the 10 minute mark, damn. There's also going to be more interfaces and tools to give a player more feedback in terms of how naval engagement panned out and as to why to inform your naval strategy going forward. Admirals are getting the same makeover as generals got in Wake and Attire, which is awesome. There will be an influx of new assignable traits which will tailor your admirals to suit specific roles, like Halsey carriers, awesome. Manda Gun is very early in development. They're not even sure it will be out this year and there are a few things that have, there are only a few things I actually started coding. Arch Iron 4 is still standing despite its lingering problems and is now more confident in what kind of game it wants to be. It may not be the war game it once was, but striving to be more of an accessible, yet authentic World War II sandbox is not a bad thing. More accessible, yet authentic World War II sandbox is not a bad thing. Yeah, I'm basically saying we want to make this more of a casual game, which I'm not on board. Anyway, guys, this, that does it for this video. Uh, honestly, if you know my points, I kind of believe Heart to Iron 4 lost a lot, a lot, in terms of the game once was. It's it's kind of like, it, it's been, a lot of key features were stripped. I I really, you know, I try to get into it. I, I played the English, I played the Americans. It, it lost a lot. The chain of command, the militia system, the Navy, uh, the Air Force is, I would say, a little bit better system, but yeah, a lot's been, chain of command was the biggest thing, I would say. The chain of command was probably the worst thing that they, stripping that out was probably the worst. Anyway, that's, that does it for this video. See you guys in the next one. Peace.